operating at an extraordinary level can seem challenging. Learn how to survive in the lone wolf economy in the OG Money Podcast with Lonnie Gordon Agolnik. Drawing on over 20 years of experience in the trenches of Wall Street, Lonnie explores what it takes to be successful in today's rapidly changing environment. From daily routines, wealth strategies, and sustaining the highest levels of wisdom, Lonnie and his guests unpack proven ways to live an extraordinary life. Welcome to the OG Money Podcast. We have a special guest today, Robert Breedlove. He's an OG Bitcoiner in the Twitter community. He's got his podcast, What Is Money? He's doing a lot of things in the space. Um, why don't you introduce yourself, Robert, to many people that may not be in this little world that we're in on Twitter about you know what you're doing now, and then we'll dive I always go back into the past and then we speed up into the present. So tell us a little bit about what's going on right now. Sure. Thanks for having me. Uh, My name is Robert. I have my undergraduate and master's degree in accounting and finance. I'll give you the super high speed version here. Uh, It's been a few years as an entrepreneurial uh, strategy consultant, essentially. So it's helping high net worth individuals, tax partnerships, make money, save money, uh, then went out on the CFO path. I was a career CFO for a number of years, mostly focused in tech. And then I started investing in, started in 2014, but didn't get heavily involved in crypto asset space until 2016. And at that time, started investing heavily because I had kind of had my light bulb moment. And then in 2017, which was a big year for the market, market was up 1800, 1800% that year. Uh, we launched a hedge fund pretty much organically through that process. Everyone in my warm network knew I was investing, wanted to figure out how to get involved. So launched a hedge fund, operated that for three years. Recently got, got out of that business in 2020, actually, because going down the Bitcoin rabbit hole has made me realize where my real value and skill set is. And I think it's more in Bitcoin education, uh, specifically reading, writing, talking about Bitcoin which I'm hoping to bring to the world now with the newly launched What Is Money show. Um, first guest there was Michael Saylor, who invested $1.3 billion in Bitcoin in 2020 and just announced another, I think, $900 million that his company MicroStrategy is putting in. And the theme of the show is sort of deep conversations or first principle exploration. So we, like Michael and I, literally started in the Stone Age to build this intellectual edifice up to the modern age to explain the significance of Bitcoin. Um, So I plan on talking to a lot of the world's greatest thinkers uh, about topics, all centered around that question, which I think gets people to Bitcoin indirectly, which is asking themselves, what is money? Yeah. And this is the OG Money Podcast. And, you know, if you think about it, we're, we're living through a transformational period unlike anything that anyone even can comprehend or understand, right? Like, sort of like the invention of electricity. And That's right. uh, if you sit at a dinner table today, I don't know if you have this experience, but I'll sit around a table with 100 people, very intelligent, smart, made tons of money, millionaires, billionaires. They look at me like I still have three heads. Right now, they're starting to look at me and, and ask questions, but you're still really, I mean, the adoption curve is so early, right? Like Elon Musk just invested last week. Um, as far as the What Is Money podcast series goes, that series with Michael Saylor is the best thing on the internet I've ever listened to. I've only ever listened or watched two other things as much as I've listened to that series. One is The Men Who Made America, you know that uh, show on Amazon Prime? I've like, heard of it, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's just, it's Carnegie, it's Rockefeller, it's Ford, you know, all the guys who built America. And it's so, like, that's the first stage. And then now the Bitcoin, it just go. it's like Bitcoin's like the next thing, right? From sure. steel. So when you roll that out with Sailor, it kind of was like the next phase of the men who built America. It's my box. Yeah. And then the other thing that I can watch on repeat a million times is Goodfellas. I mean, that's just, you know, whatever it's on, it's... You know, Classic. yeah, but those three things I've, I'm putting in there. So I'm assuming you're done with the series with Sailor, huh? That was nine. I keep looking for 10, but uh, I, I'm, I'm keeping We're not done. 
Okay, great. Actually, all right. That's yeah, great. we've got at least one more. Sailor and I, we're already iterating on the next conversation outline. Uh, so we'll have at least one more episode, but uh, maybe more. You know, originally Sailor and I just recorded twice. We did two. We did a five-hour session, a five-and-a-half-hour session. That became nine episodes. So we'll do at least one more recording session. That could be one. That could be between one and three episodes. So we'll see. Well, that's phenomenal news. So um, yeah. aside from, uh, you know, we're going to circle back to the What Is Money podcast in a little bit, but I like to always go, you know, a little bit like in your childhood. I always like to see the sparks. Like, what were you like, let's say, at 12 to 15 years old, 16, 17 years old in that era where, like, you started to see some sparks happening, right? What, like, what was happening in your life where, you know, eventually you led up to <clears throat> finance, money, you know, now Bitcoin? What was happening then? So this is actually a pretty interesting story. I, first of all, as a kid, specifically really fascinated with the stars. I remember I grew up in Tennessee, so we'd go camping a lot. And I would always find myself just staring up at the stars, wondering what, you know, WTF, what's going on here? What is all this? And then around the age of, I guess, 10 or 11, we started to take, we started having uh, summer reading books assigned to us in school. So you take a book home for the summer, you have to read it, you come back, you take a test on it. So around this age, I started to pick up the skill of reading. I really started to enjoy reading. Uh, I guess this is about 11 years old. And I remember I went, once I figured out I could grab any book, go into a bookstore, grab any book I wanted, educate myself, just download this information from whoever in the world about whatever. I went straight to the deep end of the pool and started reading astrophysics. I was reading Stephen Hawking. I was reading Brian Greene. These other prolific authors that just describe what the universe is, basically the physics of the universe. And that... I didn't know it at the time, but I think that just sort of set me on this lifelong trajectory of, of learning, just the self-education for, for the rest of my life. Um, and first principles thinking too, because I'm always asking the why, like trying to get to the bottom of things. So that gave me this good, good foundation. And then it's interesting enough, I started playing this video game around the age of 12 or 13. It was a massive multiplayer online game so, so a lot of people have heard of world of warcraft this is by the same maker of that game the game is called diablo the one i was playing with diablo 2 and the game is essentially you're in the video game fighting demons kind of like dungeons and dragons on a computer i guess you could say but there's millions of people around the world playing it so there's the game itself you can go into the game and pursue the demons and equip yourself with armor and weapons and crawl the dungeons, etc. And then you can also come outside of the game and there's an economy, there's markets. People are trading items or buying and selling items between one another. Every item is unique. It has certain characteristics that give you, you know, different attributes in the game. And I started out playing the first game, the, the playing in the dungeons and whatnot, and then ended up playing more in the, the markets, the economy, which they called the trading channels. And eventually I was just playing the trading channels. I was just buying low. There were all these different channels you could go into at different times of the day. And I figured that basically learned organically how to buy low and sell high and how to, how to craft my advertisements well. I taught myself how to type super fast. I was like typing 90 words a minute uh, by the time I got into this thing. And so I like to joke that I was into digital assets before Bitcoin. This was, you know mid 90s i guess how old are you i'm 35 now okay yeah and so mid so i guess it's late 90s actually because yeah i was 14 in 2000 and then well so what happened with this is that these items in the game eventually when ebay became popular people started selling these items for real money for do real money for dollars let's say and the, the wealth that I accumulated in the game became substantial wealth in, on eBay. You could sell one really rare item for thousands of dollars. Um, so that left this mark with me that there's something too digital. Like we're really, there's, there's a big movement here that we can abstract value into the digital domain 
and transact it in a unique way. I don't need to hand you a table to have a transaction executed. We can do things, not even things, not even digital representations of real things, but just digital things. Again, these are just, just digital items in a game that had real monetary exchange value. Yeah, so um, Facebook's trying to do that now, right? Isn't that whole Facebook, like, that was the idea behind Libra, right? So you could just kind of sell something to somebody across the country or on another continent with no costs. Isn't that similar to what they were really trying to establish? So my, the, the thesis that I think I derived from this is that the world is becoming a video game. And I would argue today, you know, look at your life. How many of your relationships, interactions, efforts are mediated by a screen? Right, how much screen time do we all have today, especially in the wake of COVID? I mean, we are playing video games all the time. And it, it's, um, I think a lot of the, a lot of the features and whatnot that we actually have in video games are being used in business applications now. Like people are always trying to gamify things and you know make make them either engaging or rewarding or, or competitive in some respect. So I really think, you know, and this gets into the sovereign individual thing a bit, is that software, like Andreessen said, software is eating the world. We underestimate how profound of a statement that is. Like software is eating everything, everything that we do, every relationship that we have, every interaction. Um, and it's only getting started, by the way, because we haven't even got it into augmented reality or virtual reality yet. Like we're, we're mediating most of our re relationships and whatnot through this phone, but this phone is a stricture, right? It's, it's, it's in the way. The technology is going to get more and more out of the way as we get into the next 10 years. These things are just going to be uh, embedded in everything that we interact with. So I think we're in the middle of something really profound, like a digital Renaissance type event that I would say the history books, but they probably won't be books. Uh, when they're written, they're going to regard this as a profound period of change, you know, akin to the agricultural age or the industrial age. Okay. So uh, I want to just stop you for a second and uh, let's just discuss the fact that like what I love about what you're doing now on podcasts and, and talking you originally on Twitter, I was reading your stuff and it was literally the most insightful. It was like a book. It was amazing. Um, Thank you. What I found though, and I don't know if you found this, I was a voracious, I mean like voracious reader for the last 15 or 20 years. Then I was like, okay, I'm going to audiobooks. I just don't have time to sit and read as much, so I'm now going to listen to the books. Now, with the advent of these podcasts, I'm kind of addicted to the podcasts, and I can't even get through a book anymore. Like, I'm mm. in the middle of Sovereign Individual, but every single time I'm about to hit play on Sovereign Individual— I get four new pop-ups on my podcast list that I, that I got to, you know, <laughs> listen to. And that's in real time. So I'm getting real-time information feed, real-time data. The fact that I'm in the middle of Sovereign Individual, and you just mentioned it, and I know you're a big fan of it just from listening to the podcast that you've been on. Why don't you just give us the cliff notes on the Sovereign Individual? And what I found most interesting is... Um, I often hear you talk about the history of the agricultural age into the information age and how that matters with violence and like get the listeners engaged in the book Sovereign Individual, you know, through a Cliff Notes version. And then let's power down onto what you just found to be the most profound parts of the Sovereign Individual. I'm writing a series on this right now as well. It's just an essay series that I'll be going through the book sort of chapter by chapter, and then explaining its key themes through my own lens, which I'm calling sovereignism. I think actually Bitcoin specifically enables a new form of socioeconomic organization that is fundamentally different than this false dichotomy we have between capitalism and communism. Um, and it's a, that's why it's a, lot, it's a lot to take in because we have something unprecedented, right? It'd be like trying to explain the industrial age to a hunter gatherer society. They just can't even comprehend how profound it is. So I guess to give you a little bit of backdrop, first of all, the 
big theme in the book is that the logic of violence, actually, the economic returns to violence actually shape human history in really significant ways. And the authors go through a number of instances of this. They go through the gunpowder revolution, which basically restored a symmetry of violence. So originally you could be one knight on horseback and you could take out a whole town, a whole town of villagers, basically. But once gunpowder was invented, all of a sudden you could be that one villager and you could take out a knight from 200 yards away with a rifle. Right? So it, ch it changes the power dynamics and how people organize themselves with one simple invention like gunpowder. And just to get into kind of the origins of government, we, government did not exist in hunter-gatherer society. It was just every, kind of, every man for himself, you know, you hunt, you gather. There's a, a big symmetry of information and violence because everyone's pretty much equipped with the same daggers and spears and whatnot. Everyone's nomadic. Government arose in the agricultural age once we created savings. So once we started to accumulate grain or livestock or other forms of food stuff or anything that's capital valuable across time, we had something to protect. So to protect that capital, a business emerged that we call today government. It's basically the protection service of property rights or of capital. And that's, so that all started in the agricultural age. And then over time, basically the, the specialist in violence, which is what a government is, they, they protect and preserve the property rights and the capital and the peace in, in the society so it can trade and generate wealth. But over time, they tend to also take advantage of those that they protect. So it's, it's the local monopoly on violence that also tends to wield that violence when it runs out of money or things get dicey over the very people it's protecting to fund itself, essentially. And that's kind of the pattern we've seen repeat throughout history is that the, the monopoly on violence, which is the government, it's very closely intertwined with the monopoly on money, which is like the one market in the world that no government really lets go of that we've never had a real free market for money aside from the late 19th century we had this global gold standard that was sort of a free market but governments always give in to the temptation to control the money essentially and the reason bitcoin changes this so much is that all money before bitcoin could be violently confiscated so with gold specifically there were a lot of incentives, first of all, just to centralize the custody of it. Gold's very expensive to move across space and settle um, and secure. So there were, it was more economically efficient to put it all in one warehouse, issue paper backed by gold, and then let people transact in that paper instead. So it emerged actually as a, just a warehouse business function, but it became the bank and it became the central bank. But when you centralize control over money like that, you're centralizing power effectively because money is power. It's, it's the command over the work of others, essentially. And that's what has em empowered this large scale nation state is that they can centralize control of the money. But with something like Bitcoin, and that's also the reason they go to war, right? So when, when Nazi Germany would invade a country in World War II, their first stop once they conquer them would be straight to the central bank and they would plunder their gold hoard. So it's like, gold, you have to consider that gold is geopolitical money, right? It's the reason nations are going to war. It's how they're funding war. Uh, it's what all their currencies are premised on, all their debt is premised on, is either their own gold holdings or their treaties with other countries that have gold holdings. So like gold is the game humans have been playing. The story of man is the story of gold kind of thing. So then you introduce Bitcoin. Bitcoin, 12 years in, it's a digital disruptor to gold. Now, we're, it's very uncertain where this, how this game plays out because we have no comparison. We have the game of gold that man's been playing for 5,000 years. We have the game of Bitcoin that's 12 years old that could be, you know, could really be literally a game changer, a brand new game. The reason it's so different is because you can't confiscate Bitcoin if it's properly custody. Even if 
say, a Nazi Germany invaded a country, if they were on a, a Bitcoin standard, there'd be no economic benefit to a Germany invading a country. They wouldn't have any money to steal at the end of that because the Bitcoin, as we know, it can be stored kind of everywhere and nowhere. It's just information. So this concept of theft-proof money is, I think, just permeating all of our socioeconomic organization and institutions and that everyone faces these massive incentives to hold money that can't be stolen, confiscated, or inflated. And just to give you a little bit of numbers on the average U.S. taxpayer. So average U.S. taxpayer pays about $10,000, 500 in direct taxation per year. Uh, that does not count inflation, which inflation as of 2020 was about a, no a doubling of that. So people were losing purchasing power at a, a rate of about double that. If you could instead, if that average U.S. taxpayer could instead take that $10,500 he sends the U.S. government every year and instead put it into a savings account that yielded 10% per year, after a 40-year working life, that savings account would be worth $4.4 million. And again, we're not counting inflation, just looking at direct taxation. So just zeroing in on this average U.S. taxpayer, the incentives to adopt something like Bitcoin are equivalent to the question, would you change your savings account from your local bank to the bank of Bitcoin for $4.4 million in retirement savings? That's the type of pressure and incentives that all market actors face when considering where to hold their savings over time. And so this pressure, in my estimation, and in, in the book, The Sovereign Individual, says people are basically just going to be forced into this thing. They're going to be forced to hold the money that is most resistant to inflation and confiscation. Otherwise, they're going to get, they're going to be victims of government predation through inflation and taxation. And as people adopt this ultimate offshore bank of Bitcoin or the bank of Bitcoin, whatever you want to call it, the revenue model of the state declines precipitously because all of a sudden you can't inflate. You can't directly tax necessarily if people are just holding this thing. Or even if, if you can directly tax unrealized gains, it's very easy to hide and move and conceal. So the government revenue model of inflation and taxation quickly falls to zero or near zero. And so what happens after that? What happens when the largest institution in the world that organizes most human affairs gets disrupted effectively? Its revenues just decline uh, you know, radically. How do we organize ourselves after that? And that's what the sovereign individual explores. Okay, let's touch two things. I want to go on inflation uh, first, uh, because I think this is something that people hear the word, but not necessarily understand the word, right? So we have our CPI. You also yeah. have Michael Saylor uh, often stating that the real rate of inflation is somewhere between 10 upwards to 25%. So mm -hmm. explain to the viewer, really, what is CPI and, and what is Saylor talking about when he's saying that his cash is melting at 15% a year, like an ice cube? Yeah, so first of all, it is impossible to have a single universal inflation metric. Uh, inflation is based on the values of the individual market actor. So it's what I desire to buy, right? If I, and as Sailor brilliantly elaborates, if you're looking at a house in, a Ham, in the Hamptons, right? That's inflating at 30% per year or whatever it is. CPI is just a small index of things, a basket of goods that the government hand picks. Example? I don't even know what they put in the basket. Here's, I can tell you what they exclude from the basket. They exclude things that have price volatility, which means that the price changed, which seems pretty self-defeating to exclude things whose price has changed from an index designed to track price changes. Right. So it's, they are um, constantly changing the math and the calculation to back into this 2% number, which is their stated mandate effectively. But in reality, just like value itself, value is subjective, right? What you value is different from what I value. No one can tell you what your percentage value on anything is. No one can tell you what your inflation, your, everyone has their own inflation coefficient, if you will. Right. It's the things you seek to buy in the world. How many 
as we increase the supply of dollars and dollars are chasing these things that tend to be, you know, they'll chase things that are more desirable, harder, if you will, whether it's early retirement via a U.S. Treasury bond or it's house in the Hamptons or it's premier Los Angeles real estate, those things tend to inflate more quickly um, because they're more desirable. Whereas things that we can produce more easily, YouTube subscriptions or, or laptops, you know, technology is a great example of a deflationary TVs. industry because TVs, because we're, we are becoming more intelligent and efficient at producing electronics and, and other uh, goods and services in the technology space. We're getting faster at that than we are at printing money, right? So it's, it's a rate of change comparison. And another way to think about it is how energy intensive is the thing that you're buying or selling. If it's a ribeye steak, it doesn't really matter how much smarter we get. We're not going to make, we can't make the cow grow faster or eat grass quicker or any of that. Ribeye steak tends to be a pretty good uh, proxy for money supply increases. So because it's a very energy intensive product. But if you look at something like, uh, you know, a, an iPhone or even they've increased prices, but other electronics, they're actually getting less energy intensive because they're making them smarter. They're mass producing them uh, more quickly and easily. So CPI is a lie, is the gist of it. Um, there was a website called the Chapwood Index that was actually netting out, it was aggregating cost of living metrics across a number of major cities. That was a little more accurate, but in, in reality, you can just look at the US M2 as a rough proxy, right? It's the change in money supply. Any amount we increase the money supply, we're arbitrarily rearranging riches. We're allocating wealth away from some, anyone using dollars as a store of value, towards those that receive newly printed money first. This is the cancel on effect. So it's, it's very important for people to grasp this. Quantitative easing, printing money, it's not what it sounds like. It's all a euphemism, frankly. It's, it's just theft. It's flat out theft. It's whoever has monopolized the money can now print money that the rest of you have to work for and they can use it to buy stuff. Any, they can use it to buy anything. It's money, right? It's pure optionality in the marketplace. And the cost of that printing is externalized onto society and it's externalized in a way that victimizes the most economically vulnerable among us the most. The poor, those living on fixed income, retirees, pensioners, all these people that depend on the store value function of the dollar are getting victimized in this, this scheme. So fiat, and I've argued about this in a lot of my writing, fiat currency is by definition a pyramid scheme. And it's a lot, the big bitter pill to swallow perhaps, that the dominant currency in the world is a pyramid scheme, but that is the fact of the matter. Um, and in, inflation is, it, it's misunderstood by most people. What, what, what are your thoughts like, uh, I mean, so as a financial advisor, I have a 70, 75 year old woman, 30 year treasury, 2% German bonds. The entire yield curve is negative. Right. I mean, I got to buy Amazon and Apple as like their new safety net of like a store of value. That's right. It's, it's absolutely insane. And what I noticed in March of 2020 was the bonds, the high yield bonds, you know, they got wrecked and lack of liquidity while the Amazons, the Netflix, the Zooms, the DocuSigns, they came back fast. They came back the hardest. And had it not been for the government printing, I think, upwards to $10 trillion, right? What was it, like 30% of all new dollars have been printed in the, universe, in the United States since March? Yeah, 108 years of Federal Reserve history printing dollars. I think it's 30%. So one out of every $3 ever produced in 108 years produced in the past 12 months. Right. So what, what I, you know, what came to my brain was like, Unfortunately, whether or not the regulators or whoever compliance realizes, I have to buy the NASDAQ for the 70-year-old woman. That's right. Because That's right. you need $10 million in a 10-year treasury to get a hundred grand. Who has $10 million right. to get a hundred grand a year? Right. Versus Apple exactly up 43% right. 
or 63%, and they did less revenues in 2017. So as a financial advisor, um, yeah, I look like the black sheep because I'm not doing the 60-40 thing right now. That game is over. Game is over, and it's been destroyed by the incentive scheme underlying fiat currency. Actually, what you're experiencing is being pushed further out along the risk spectrum to preserve wealth because fiat currency has been totally compromised, right? And so government bonds are gonna yield less and less while inflation goes higher and higher. So we have these, this increasing negative real yield that's pushing anyone that wants to store wealth across time, which is everyone, everyone wants to protect wealth, forces them into riskier investors, right? You're in equities today, you could be in junk bonds small, you could be in private equity deals, you know, the year after that, it's just gonna get worse, basically, as negative real yields expand, people get pushed further out along the risk curve. And this points too to another incentive related to Bitcoin is that at the very end of that risk curve today is something like Bitcoin, right? It's the most, in a volatility, purely volatility terms, it's the most risky asset in the world. It's the ultimate risk on asset. Um, but what's interesting about it is that as people are being forced into it, right? So more and more capital is being pushed into it to either satisfy pension obligations, right? There's all these defined uh, benefit pension obligations that are underfunded or people like your client that are just trying to preserve wealth. They're getting pushed into equities. Maybe they buy a little GBTC as a, you know, one or 5% allocation to hit their target yield. As people are pushed into this ultimate risk on it, asset that is Bitcoin, it grows in market capitalization and increases the chances that it becomes the ultimate risk off asset, right? Something disruptive to gold. So I don't know if you've ever seen this thing called Exeter's Pyramid. It's an inverted pyramid. It's got gold at the bottom, derivatives at the top. And basically any, in times of economic crisis, people fly to the bottom. They want to get into trust minimized, highly liquid money, which is gold effectively. Bitcoin's sort of descending Exeter's pyramid. It's cutting through all of these things as capital is forced into it. And the properties that made gold gold, Bitcoin, it, it perfects it quantitatively and qualitatively is better than gold across all properties of money. So it's seemingly, so long as it continues to operate as it has flawlessly for the past 12 years, it's seemingly unstoppable. Let me cross borders here on gold for a second because um what's absolutely mind-boggling to me on the gold front is uh you can go to gld 2011 and you're down 10 percent mm. in gld yeah so what has gold done for anybody as an inflation hedge while the balance sheet of the fed in those 10 years has what i mean how i mean four or five x yeah so gold has been really great over the long term, but you have to keep in mind that central banks own 20% of the total supply. There is overwhelming evidence that they systemically suppress its price oh, yeah. in the derivatives markets. London Gold Pool, there's a web, great website on this. It's the Gold Antitrust Action Committee, I think, it's GATA.org. They go through all the evidence. That Some guys got arrested. Some guys at, what was it? One of the banks, they got arrested. Yeah. Or, or yeah, was, uh, I'm, it's been really, it's very obvious, Frank. Even Alan Greenspan had a quote. He's like, we, the United States cannot legalize a sound store of value and have a welfare slash warfare state. Like you, the, the idea of fiat currency depends on there being no sound store value alternative. Otherwise, people would just hold the alternative, sell the dollars, fiat collapses. Um, so that's why we had Executive Order 6102. That's why they manipulate gold's price in the paper markets. That's why Fed's balance sheet has expanded tremendously the past 10 years, but gold's done nothing. Um, and that's why Bitcoin is... So fascinating because it's the one thing they can't stop. So it ends up being this true barometer for central bank market manipulation. So let's go there for a second. You say the government can't stop it. That's sort of always been in the back of my mind as my biggest fear, like the government will not allow this. I know you spoke to Gary V and battled with Gary V recently on a podcast I listened to. Uh, that was his big thing. Um, you always have in the back of your mind that the government is going to put something yesterday i heard janet yellen be like well 
we're going to, you know, regulate the uh, on-off ramps to make sure there's no illegal activity. But she brushed it off like, oh, yeah, it's doing well right now. It's a good asset. She, she didn't yeah. see him. Uh, and Gary Gensler's coming in. Uh, he taught MIT. He, he spoke uh, for, what, the last few years about just Bitcoin. So he's pretty knowledgeable. Is this administration, mm-hmm. could it possibly be a pro-Bitcoin administration? Or is that not possible? You know, I'm not sure. I, I actually keep my head out of the politics because I, I actually think in the aftermath of all of this transition, the sovereign individual thesis playing out, politics will be rendered completely irrelevant. The fact that we have a popularity contest to decide who gets to make the rules for society will seem like an anachronistic thing that we did, is my belief. When does that, when does um, that play I mean, out? When does that like, because that's not... I mean, I think it, it's happening right now. It's, it's, these, these things take everything's getting faster and faster. So I can't tell you how long it's going to take, but it's happening right now. Bitcoin has a $1 trillion fully diluted market cap. It's not getting, there's no way you can stop it. It's just, it, once a, a digital network get, gets to that size and becomes so deeply enmeshed in the existing financial system, and now you have large equities and large capital pools like Mass Mutual with investments in this asset, Every time someone takes exposure to this network, they bring with them their army of lobbyists and, and influence and all of that. So it's just taking over, I think, slowly but surely. But no one today, again, it's just viewed as this cool speculative investment that can get you really high returns or, or maybe increase the sharp ratio in your portfolio. I don't, even myself included, I've studied this thing deeply and exclusively for four years. I don't comprehend the implications of where this goes. I'm trying, we're all trying to figure it out. It's an innovation, I think, at least as big as the internet, probably bigger. We're actually probably going to regard the invention of the internet as the segue to Bitcoin, actually. Um, If it does indeed, you know, defund and disrupt the nation state model. So I think that, the politics of it, it's just the game theory is going to play out there where they have, you're basically forced to adopt. You can try to outlaw and ban it, but then you're just going to restrict economic activity into your jurisdiction. You're going to incentivize other jurisdictions to be more friendly. And it's like the, the internet, like everyone saw, every country in the world saw the boon the American economy got from taking the do not harm approach to the internet. Right? We created the most valuable companies in the world right here in the U.S. And I don't think anyone wants to miss that, that next wave of innovation, uh, the U.S. included. So, and it's quickly apparent that this is it. This is the wave of innovation post-internet. Yeah, so as an advisor, like I early, I went in very early in Square as I saw Jack Dorsey was leading the charge with his Cash App. Um, he was enabling buying and selling of Bitcoin um, on the Cash App. Uh, he recently put fifty million dollars of his balance sheet in there, and he's building out an entire crypto bank within Square. Right? Do you have any insight into what he's doing there? Because uh, I, I would feel very comfortable moving my money or Bitcoins or what have you into a publicly traded company like Square. Right? Um, mm. I'm, I'm looking forward to that day because you really want to have, you know, the responsibility of a FINRA SEC type company that, you know, you're, you're, I would say, you know, if, if anything happens that, you know, Jack Dorsey would be responsible, but from a political standpoint, I think he's also a very big ally and, uh, he's talking to a lot of people on Capitol Hill. Uh, he actually went to mm-hmm. war with Donald Trump on Twitter. Um, so he has mm-hmm. a lot of allies on Capitol Hill. So I think he's a, a very, very good advocate for Bitcoin. I, I look at him as like, sort of like one of the one of the lead lead guys in the space um and that i agree with that yeah and that takes me over you know there's companies like overstock you know they've got you know their whole medici ventures Uh, i've been involved with that company for a while because you know i'm looking at the space but let's get into a little bit about the what is money uh series you did with with michael saylor and i i got to imagine you have I'll say, let's just keep the number to five most mind blowing things that you took from it. Does five sound like a good number? And you can add or less. It doesn't matter. (laughs) But, but like, I need to listen to that really. Like every time I listen to it, I'm like, well, how did I miss that? 
Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, you miss yeah, things. Yeah, yeah. But th- is this guy just off the charts smart? Like, I don't know if I've ever uh, listened to someone as intelligent uh, as this guy. I mean. Yeah. I mean, Michael is brilliant, frankly, and I, I don't use that term lightly. He, I, I actually believe he's one of the greatest thinkers of our age, greatest living thinkers of our age. Uh, the the Bitcoin play he executed at MicroStrategy could make him one of the wealthiest people in the world at some point, if the, especially if things play out the way we think they are going to. And he's a guy that, you know, you could read a, a bit about him, but he's been kind of a lifelong learner himself. Um, he's always been into tech and innovation and studying the history of scientific revolutions and paradigm shifts. So he is a guy predisposed to understanding the significance of Bitcoin, right? He wrote a book in 2010 called, um, I think it was The Mobile Wave. Mobile Wave, yeah. Basically, yeah, basically said go out, Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, Google are going to eat everything, like just buy and hold these stocks, essentially. That was 2010. Clearly, history bore that out. And I think he he had every puzzle piece in place to understand how big of a deal Bitcoin is, except maybe the monetary piece, which COVID just sort of forced his hand on, right? All of a sudden, the world changes. Central banks respond in an unprecedented way. He's sitting on this uh, slug of cash, you know, half a billion dollars of cash. He has to figure out what to do with it from a treasury management standpoint. And that got him going down uh, the 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 monetary rabbit hole. And I think once he had that final puzzle piece in, um, he was, you know, fully equipped to understand Bitcoin. So how do you hook up with him? Where does that happen? So we, yeah, he, um, he made an announcement actually out of the blue about, uh, his treasury allocation on Twitter. I think it was maybe August. Can we, can we, can we take a step back before we run into that and just discuss how fucking powerful is Twitter? I mean, I DM'd you, you got yeah. a DM from Sailor. I yeah. mean, it's, yeah. insane. It's, it's really insane how powerful Twitter is. And I, I'm no, really an is. investor in that company for a very long time. And the politics of it made me a little like weary because it's so like, yeah. but it's just an, an outrageously an amazing tool. Well, back, we're back to kind of the beginning of the conversation where we talk about this digital renaissance that we're living in it is truly profound and as sailor would describe in his book these tools let us bend time and space so it's like magic effectively the conversation we're having right now is basically magic 20 years ago right no one could have thought this was even possible twitter is magic right you can have these conversations in little ideological spheres about whatever topic you're interested in with everyone else in the world interested in the same topic and it's just we've we've accelerated the global hive mind in a way that I don't think any of us comprehend. Um, so yeah, it's so he they make the announcement. He DMs me. I'm like, oh wow, this is awesome. You know, congratulations, big move. Was really just came out of the blue, and then we just started talking. Um, I think he had reached out to a few other Bitcoiners that he had read their work and you know said it was brilliant, and. Um, we're just chatting. I'm like, well, look, I've been, I've had this idea for this show. You know, I've been talking to people about Bitcoin for years now. And I've found that the right way to, this is kind of like the movie inception, right? You can't force an idea on somebody. You can't come at them and just tell them this, that, and the other and expect all the meaning that you have in your mind to be received by theirs. People have defense mechanisms and they have their own lens to which they're seeing the world. But I found that if you can just present this question, what is money? It's like, you just go ask yourself that question. Keep asking it and see what you find. That is a pathway to Bitcoin. It's like, it's like actually incepting Bitcoin into people's mind. And so my theory here with the show is that this digital age has just completely collapsed the cost of information access. And, and in doing so, it's going to make everyone a lot smarter. So the, the, the equivalent that we saw actually 500 years ago was with the invention of the printing press, the Gutenberg printing press, the cost of access to information collapsed. So all of a sudden people all over the world became a lot smarter. Like there were a lot, a lot more thinkers, a lot more variety of thinkers. Um, and these thinkers, these critical thinkers became heretical to the church over time and actually brought down that institution. 
So again, it was one small technological innovation that brought down the dominant institution of the time. And I think we're going through something similar now where anyone can access information about anything across all of history at, at, a, at a keystroke effectively. And I think this is just going to invigorate the intellectual capacity of mankind over the next 10 or 20 years. So what I hope to do with the show, it's kind of like the uh, intellectual Olympics or something. I want to sit down and talk to the smartest people on the planet about their worldview from a first principle standpoint and build it, you know, from the basis all the way into the modern age and then how they see the future. And I'm just incredibly fortunate to have Sailor as a first guest. I don't think I could have asked for a better first guest. He sets the bar really high. So what you asked about. Yeah. What I, what I was saying was like, what was like a few things that you were just like, Oh, like, I mean, there's a lot in there, but like, is there anything in there that like when it hit you, you were just yeah. like, Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah, so one, and this is his overarching thesis, basically, is that mankind is the animal that channels energy across time and space in accordance with his intellect, basically. So we're, we're building these ideological structures in the world, and then we're actually channeling energy into them to, to create them, right? So, and, and this is different than any other animal um, in that we we can create these these how do you say it these symbolic structures if you will that we can all work on and agree to and then we can coordinate our efforts to make it a thing so like building a skyscraper for instance we can put it all on paper we use the symbols of mathematics and language to coordinate all of our efforts and then through the medium of money, basically, uh, we can coordinate all those efforts to make to materialize this thing that we've intellectualized. So the simple way to say it, I think, is that mankind is the animal that channels energy across time and space. And money, as say, the answer that Sailor gave to the question, what is money? Money is the highest form of energy that mankind can channel across time and space. So you can think of money as like a claim on all other forms of energy. So it can give you, give you access to chemical energy, human energy, nuclear, whatever it may be. It's pure optionality in the marketplace. So we are trading, like mankind trades to survive and become more energy efficient. Money is like the most tradable thing. So it's the highest expression of our highest, of our defining characteristic. So that just really blew my mind and started me thinking about the world in energetic terms. Um, the connection you made earlier too, where you're talking about the men who made America, Sailor started to describe this use of standards in the world actually, where entrepreneurs go out into the free market, they figure things out, they develop standards basically. And then once, once other market participants go on to those standards, whether this is like the width of a rail track or this is the you know size of a telephone cable or, or an electrical outlet. We have all these standards that we use to interoperate so that we, we have things that we don't need to think about anymore and we can think about solving other problems. These standards unlock energy efficiency in a really profound way. And, and th so he was going through all that throughout history. And that unlocked for me Bitcoin. It's like Bitcoin being the ultimate monetary standard. It's finally we have a money that everyone can universally see and agree to. We don't need to trust anyone. We don't need to trust any government not to manipulate the standard. Almost like a calendar, if you will. If you want to talk about how essential it is, like we have something to manage time and energy with that's ultra standardized that in turn unlocks all, all kinds of, you know, energy efficiency or productivity for human beings everywhere. So he brought this great engineering lens to the whole equation of money. And uh, it's been very influential on my thinking and writing lately. Yeah. And, you know, I, I, I often get a question, you know, because I'm in finance, I'm in money and everyone's like, Oh, what's going on? Bitcoin. What's up? So when someone asks me, you know, can you explain Bitcoin? And I said, well, think of it this way, right? You have New York city. And in today's world, like you mentioned, software is eating everything. 
Imagine there's a city in cyberspace that's being built as we speak, and there's only 21 million blocks that are in that city. And people today, yeah. just like real estate in Manhattan, they're rushing in to buy a piece of that real estate. Right. And then what's going to be built on top of that over the next five to 10 years is going to be mind boggling. In my opinion, JP Morgan, I think yesterday announced BlackRock announced that they're, they're realizing from an institutional demand side, they have to be involved. I guess my That's question right. for you would be, you're a little dialed into this world, but as far as I'm concerned, you know, GBTC, I don't like it. I just, it trades at a premium. I won't bring it to clients mm -hmm. because of that. I'm just waiting for that ETF to come out. And I think that's a flood for the RIA space. It's a flood for the retail space. Do you see an exchange traded fund? I know NY Dig just put in, Morgan Stanley put in. Yeah. Is this going to happen anytime soon? The... I will make my prediction that the NIDIG ETF that they just filed will be approved. Wow. When? They, I mean, who knows how long it takes. Regulators are always on their own timeline. Um, but they have addressed every issue that the SEC has cited historically, right? For both in terms of USD BTC price manipulation. The thing is bought and settled in BTC. So it eliminates that. They've got, uh, first of all, they've got a bulge back bracket bank, Morgan Stanley, as the uh, main participant. That's a big deal. They've got E&Y uh, audited financials for the past three or four years on it. They've got an E&Y certified way to price it. Um, it is, I can't, I just can't see a way that the SEC could credibly deny this particular filing they, everything has been addressed let's just put it that way um and i think it's a big deal you know it'll that that particular etf will undercut gbtc significantly i think gbtc is two percent uh management fee plus it trades at a quite a significant premium especially when volatility is high you know 14 15 16 percent this thing will trade at no premium the single trade in bitcoin 50 basis points unified fee and I, I, this is so exciting because here we have this easily accessible, transparent, low-cost vehicle for accessing Bitcoin directly, like actually holding Bitcoin through this vehicle. And I see this as Bitcoin actually imprinting its values and ethos on the market, right? It, 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 Bitcoin has this weird way of incentivizing everyone to behave more honestly, that's what it really is, is an honesty ledger, or as uh, Dan Tapiero called it, a truth machine, if you will. It's, it's, it's created pure incentives to behave honestly, and you see it operating at every level. And I'm, yeah, I'm really excited for it. I think this bull market is just getting started. Historically, all of these bull markets have been lined up with the halving cycle. And in that lens, we're just quite at the beginning of the bull market and say something like this, say it takes six months for this ETF to get approved. That's going to come at a really hot time for Bitcoin. And I think you'll just see large inflows of, of institutional capital on the back of that. Yeah. You know, what's most interesting to me that I find um, where you said gold could be manipulated by governments and banks and that, and we watched oil go negative. Why? Because derivatives were traded. Nobody wanted to take what they put out as their trade, right? If you bought one Bitcoin call option in 2019 at 3,500, you bought a leap two years out and you want it, it gets delivered by the click of a button. Yeah. It makes right. it like unmanipulative. That's right. Very, final very hard, which that's is right. mind boggling. I'm going to end off with your views on how big is it that the wealthiest man, I, I think, you know, in the world, Elon Musk, just took $1.5 billion and moved that onto the treasury of Tesla. And how many companies are going to follow that now? Yeah, it's, it's an incredibly big deal. Uh, you know, I give credit to Sailor probably for... You know, nothing spoke more loudly to Elon than Sailor's $1.3 billion move. Um, so I think Sailor's definitely the pioneer. Elon's following that playbook. But Elon's, you know, reputation and platform is, is just 
it's huge, right? He's right. the most, he is the leading visionary of the future, basically You're buying the money of the future. So I don't think you could ask for a much, uh, much better guy to make that move. And I think the de-risking that comes with that is m- massive, right? All of the conversations taking place in boardrooms or among management teams about what is their Bitcoin strategy going to be? It shifts things a lot. I was like, well, Elon did it, right? You have this yeah. it de-risk, it, whereas formerly your CFO or whatever may have been, felt a lot of career risk going that far out on the risk spectrum to buy something like Bitcoin. Now you have this uh, bulwark, I guess, in, in, in the reputation of someone like Elon. And I would expect over the next 12 to 24 months, we're just going to see a, a deluge of other balance sheets buying Bitcoin. Um, and we're seeing that, again, that the game theory of Bitcoin, this vortex of incentives that it is, it's permeating at a higher level. 2017, we saw it a lot at the retail individual level, somewhat in the hedge fund space a little bit, but now it's really getting into uh, publicly traded equities. I would think in the next cycle, or the next few years, it should start to permeate at the sovereign wealth fund level, central banks, nation states. You know, Bitcoin is, it's going to eat all the money. Yeah, I, my, my prediction. I, I clear through uh, National Financial Services, which is a subsidiary of Fidelity, and Fidelity's digital assets are up and running. They're ready to go. Yeah. Um, I got to imagine that all these banks and the regulators behind the banks are just sitting on the on the tip of their seats, realizing that this there there's an entire new world that's being birthed as we speak. Yeah. Like, it's like the birth yeah. of a newborn, a whole new asset class in front of our eyes, and most people don't even have a clue about it, which is, yeah. like you said, we're at the tip of the iceberg of this. Um, yeah. With that said, Robert, um, I know you're super busy. You're a, a hot commodity right now on the circuit. In this moment in time, I really pressed hard to get you, and you were just super, super generous with your time. You were like, yeah, let's do this. Uh, I really appreciate that. Where can people find you and uh, just – you know, let the audience know if they want to, you know, keep an eye on what you're doing, what's going on, because uh, uh, you're a super follower on Twitter. So let them know where they can find you. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. This has been a lot of fun. Uh, again, my name is Robert Breedlove. So my Twitter handle is my last name. It's at Breedlove22. So B-R-E-E-D-L-O-V-E-2-2. Uh, on there, you can find links to What Is Money Show the podcast and the YouTube channel. I've also got links to my Medium page where I post most of my writing, which got me started in all of this, frankly. To where I found you. Uh, yeah. And um, and that's it. You know, my DMs are open. Feel free to reach out. Always happy to talk Bitcoin. I consider this to be my life's work. So I wake up every day just thrilled to be able to educate people about the principles of honest money. So, Yeah. So I'm going to leave off with both you and Sailor 1 and 2 out of the the most intelligent people that I do listen to and follow in the whole space. So, you know, keep up the work. Thank you for, um, you know, making me a smarter person, a better person, a wealthier person. And, uh, we all owe you a debt of gratitude that, you know, anyone who's out there following you. So I really appreciate it and uh, keep doing the good work. Hopefully our paths will cross many more times in the future. All right. I would like that. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks again for having me. And it's an honor to be of service. Thank you for listening to the OG Money Podcast. Click the subscribe button below to be notified when new episodes become available. Securities offered through Securities America, Inc., member FINRA SIPC. Advisory services offered through Securities America Advisors, Inc., an SEC registered investment advisor. This site is published for residents of the United States and is for informational purposes only and does not constitute an offer to sell or a solicitation of an offer to buy any security or product that may be referenced herein. Persons mentioned on this website may only offer services and transact business and or respond to inquiries in states or jurisdictions in which they have been properly registered or are exempt from registration. Not all products and services referenced on this site are available in every state, jurisdiction, or from every Every person listed. Third party comments may not be representative of all customer experiences.